Welcome to the uh, Citrus Research Exchange, the fall season. I am, uh, I'm delighted to, uh, to be here. My name is Ken Goldberg. I run the uh, People and Robots Initiative within Citrus. We also have the director of Citrus here, Costas. And we have um, um, uh, Yvette and Camille. And the, uh, I want to thank everyone involved, the staff, all the, the faculty are participating, all the students and welcome you here. I also want to welcome the individuals who are coming in over the, um, over the network. Um, we are, Kosarov is back there uh, connecting us to multiple campuses so that uh, this information can be shared with, uh, with a number of partners. We, we have a, the series will run every week. There will be lunches as you can, if you sign up for them and the, and we welcome you to, to participate. Um, we have, the lineup is available in the back. There's a list of the talks that are coming up. For example, let me just see here. Next week, we have, we have um, uh, mapping the spread of aquatic plants in, from the air with Susan Ustin. We'll be, uh, we'll get, be giving the talk. And then after that, we'll have uh, James Ostrowski, another roboticist. We'll be here about um, systems for robotic weeding. So those are look, something to look forward to. I also want to mention that next week there'll be a special event here in this room on Thursday, the 22nd. It's going to be in celebration of Character Day, which is a international event that celebrates the properties of character, character strengths. And so we'll be um, having that discussion also from, that'll be from one to two right here, and we'll be screening two award-winning short films. And by the way, this is an event that's being happening in over, I just heard, over 60,000 uh, schools and universities across the world. So we'll have our discussion about that um, one to two. And also on October 5th, we have a very exciting inaugural event, which will be the um, Women in Technology Awards. And this is a, a very exciting symposium. We're going to be giving awards to a number of women who, in, in different categories. And, it will be, and they'll be here to accept the awards. And then there'll be a discussion about inspiring the next generation of women, specifically in science, technology, engineering, and math. So uh, please plan on that. That will be on the 5th. Um, that goes from 11.30 in the morning until 6 at night. OK, so with that, um, I also want to mention that the Citrus Foundry is uh, accepting applications for, um, for the fall. And uh, the deadline is the 25th. So you can visit citrusfoundry.org to find out more information about that. Or anytime, you can visit Citrus, the homepage, and get information on all of these things. All right, so without any further ado, I want to introduce Michael. Michael Ferguson is the CTO, the, C the Chief Technology Officer of Fetch. He uh, did his, um, his undergrad in math, his master's in computer science at the University of Albany. He has made a lot of contributions to Ross over the years. He was at Willow Garage. He founded um, Ven Vanadium Labs and then um, co-founded Unbounded Robotics. And now he's uh, with his uh, co-founder of uh, Fetch, Melanie Wise and is running um, Fetch Robotics. And we're very excited to hear about the latest updates from, from him. OK, Michael. Please welcome yeah. Michael first. OK, uh, so I guess first off, I should just hit on the fact that I'm not Melanie Wise. I know some of you may still be looking at programs and thinking she might be here. Uh, Melanie is uh, quite sad. She was not able to be here today. She's uh, extremely sick. and. Uh, I don't think we'd all want to listen to her talk for 40 minutes based on the short phone call I had with her a little bit ago. Um, uh, so this talk uh, is, is really going to be about uh, sort of taking robots out of the lab and, and moving them into industry, right? Um, uh, certainly uh, folks coming from an academic background, they've seen a lot of robots in the lab. We've seen really interesting things here. Uh, Berkeley uh, certainly is home to the uh, PR2 that does towel folding and, and whatnot. And that was years ago on CNN and whatnot. Uh, and so, you know, what are some of the challenges of moving these out into the, the workplace? Uh, and, and why does it take so long? Uh, before I start, I was just wondering uh, sort of what the makeup of our audience is here, uh, since this is kind of an open talk and whatnot, and sort of how many people sort of come from academia uh, versus, okay, versus industry? Are there any people who are sort of coming in from industry? Okay, a few. Um, and how many have like a, a deep understanding of robots? Okay, that's awesome. How many people have heard of the robot operating system, Ross? Okay, so more people have heard, okay, that's an interesting makeup of, I've heard about Ross, but I don't understand much about robots. Okay, so, um, cool. Uh, that gives me kind of an idea of where, where we are at. Um, so, 
Uh, Fetch Robotics. Uh, I'm actually going to start before Fetch Robotics and talk about and wow, that's a really blurry PR2. Uh, so this looks really nice on my screen. I'm not sure what's going on there. Um, but uh, some of the robots that we've worked on in the past before uh, we became Fetch Robotics, uh, members of our team uh, worked at Willow Garage on the PR2. And, and I think this is kind of the, the, the PR2 robot is one that uh, many people have seen, right? Uh, there's about 40 of them that made their way out into the world. Uh, Willow Garage did an awesome thing in uh, giving 10 of them away, basically, to kickstart a research community at the beginning. Um, and so this is a $400,000 robot um, that looks a lot nicer when it's less blurry. Uh, it's got two arms. Uh, I think you can still make that out in that blurriness. Uh, it's got a bunch of sensors on the head, so it's, it's very expensive. It has two hours of runtime when they're brand new, and now that they're all about four or five years old, they've got about 10 minutes of runtime uh, and a very custom battery, so it's extremely difficult to upgrade and replace. Uh, and effectively, they're, they're approaching their end of life as far as anybody wanting to service them and whatnot. But huge uh, leap forward that you see in the research community, uh, in academia, uh, of what people are doing for robots in a variety of places. Uh, most of the research really kind of focused on robots in the home. Uh, that was certainly what Willow was looking at, is like, we want to make robots real, we want to bring robots into the home. Uh, in addition to building the Pier 2, uh, they built the robot operating system, or ROS, which is a open source uh, BSD licensed framework uh, that has gained a lot of traction. Uh, it's used in a lot of places around the world. It's extremely cited in academia, and it's starting to also find its way into industry in places. Um, towards the later days of Willow Garage, uh, they decided, hey, we want to try and commercialize uh, these robots. Uh, and of course, the first thing they go is, okay, so what can we do with this robot? And uh, you know, who's going to pay $400,000 for it? And, and there's, there's no intersection there, really. Uh, so there were two things that sort of got kicked off. Uh, one was uh, an extensive amount of need finding to go look at what can robots do, what do people want robots to do, and what are they willing to pay for it? Uh, and then uh, in parallel with that was a technology exploration of how can we build a lower cost robot. Uh, and so the robot's in the middle, uh, and while I'm showing the render, it's the only thing I could find at the moment. I swear, we actually did build these. Uh, there were three of them. Not all of them actually ended up with arms. Uh, but these robots uh, were built for a fraction of the cost, sort of targeted at maybe a, a twenty-five dollars or $50,000 purchase price as opposed to $400,000. Uh, certainly, a uh, lot of design trade-offs that went into that. Uh, the PR2 uh, has a holonomic base, so it can drive sideways. Uh, it does this through the use of powered casters. It has 12 motors in the base. Uh, this next gen robot has two motors in the base, and a third one that did this crazy swivel thing so that it was almost holonomic, uh, but uh, if you loaded it wrong, it fell over. Uh, so not great. Most people weren't going to be happy with that. So these were some prototypes that were built in the span of about six months at Willow Garage. Uh, as that need finding progressed, um, it was getting harder and harder to find an overlap where you were going to be able to build a robot at a price point people were going to be willing to pay to do a task in the home. Um, and so our team, most of the team that worked on these platform bot robots at Willow, actually spun out of Willow uh, into a startup called Unbounded Robotics, uh, which built the UBR1. Uh, and so the UBR1 was, you know, you can see some resemblance between it and the platform bot. It was actually fairly close to a, a redesign because we built a whole new arm for it and whatnot. Um, and initially, the, the thought of Unbounded was, hey, we're a spin-off from Willow. We're going to first sell research robots because that's what we know how to do. Um, they're going to be a fraction of the cost of the PR2. Uh, people are going to buy them like crazy because now there's going to be so many more labs that are able to get a hold of them, and, and we'll figure out an industry application for it later. Um, that, robot, or that, that robot and that company actually uh, sort of got tied up in the demise of Willow, and we won't go into that. But uh, we eventually moved on to something else after that. But I want to sort of take just a moment and, and look at these and talk about like, the challenges that come with them, right? Uh, certainly the PR2, it has everything you can think of. Two arms, lots of degrees of freedom, holonomic base. Uh, it's, it's just you can't deliver it into any job that's going to uh, be cost effective. 
Um, we tried to really go all the way to the other end with the, the platform bots. Uh, you can see actually, uh, or you can't really see it on the PR2, but uh, on the UBR1, you've got the uh, laser scanner in the base, right? Everybody's maybe familiar with laser scanners on robots. It's how they localize and build maps and whatnot. Uh, we tried to go away from that and use something like a PrimeSense camera, because uh, those had come out. Um, and you could get it to work in small environments, but not really large ones. And so the cost trade-off for, hey, we saved this amount of money, but now we can't go into all these other environments just wasn't there. And so you can see we actually went back to a laser with the UBR. Um, the other aspect is that, you know, the UBR1, we were advertising uh, sort of a $35,000 price point. And one of the aspects there is that it was low power, uh, you know, got like eight to 10 hours of runtime of actually moving around. Uh, we accidentally left one on at one point and it ran for about 48 hours before it died. Uh, just kind of sitting there chilling out. So a lot more runtime, you can do a lot more work. Uh, it's a lot lower cost, but it's also lower life. Um, and, and one of the things that comes out of it is that None of these robots, the, you know, most of the PR2s that went out in the early days got refurbished later on. Uh, so they were sort of two years between, you know, major maintenance. Um, at 400k a pop, people are going to be a little bit uh, scared of that. Uh, the UBR was, was pretty much designed to handle about three years of continuous operation. Uh, people may or may not, you know, at that price point, you now you can start to get there, but you've still got this robustness issue. Um, okay, so... We've built a lot of robots along the way. Uh, when you build, have a bunch of roboticists, they're inevitably going to want to build another robot, right? And so uh, Fetch Robotics uh, gets started as a, a startup. Uh, this time we, we do it right, and then we start with, let's not just build a robot, let's talk about what the robot is actually going to do first, right? Uh, and so we went and did our own need finding, not in the home uh, at this point, uh, but in industry. Uh, and so we started looking around, and when you look around in these areas, one of the things you find is in that uh, areas like warehousing and logistics, right? So Amazon, you know, they're doing e-commerce, they're picking items, uh, packing stuff. There's a lot of small items. That's really good for robot arms because if they can move really big things, they're really powerful and they're really dangerous. Uh, so small items, that's awesome. Uh, the other part, though, is that 50% of the time that these warehouse workers are working, they're moving stuff, right? So they're pushing a cart, they're carrying things across the warehouse, they're spending a lot of time just moving stuff around. And that's actually something that robots can be really good at, right? Uh, so uh, new company starts, founded August 2014. Um, we, again, went the venture-backed route. Uh, we've raised 23 million to date uh, through two rounds. Uh, and we unveiled two robots this time uh, that uh, that sh do share some chemis uh, some uh, some pieces, right? Obviously, the base of our mobile platform Freight looks very similar to our mobile manipulator Fetch. Um, we do actually have to. Uh, most people think maybe oh, you just bolt that on. Um, in order to get it rigid enough, you do actually have to decide if it's going to be a Fetch or a Freight early on, because all of that stuff's riveted together for the torso. Uh, but so two robots, and and basically the idea here is that uh, you can build a very low cost robot that can move stuff around in bins, like freight, uh, and get all of that movement out of the way and get a really good ROI at that point. Uh, and then you can have Fetch uh, actually do your manipulation. Uh, so we've been deploying these uh, in warehousing logistics as well as some other aspects that I'll talk about shortly. Um, and we've grown from sort of four people, uh, four people in a set of cubicles to uh, about 40 people, uh, two buildings. We actually have a separate building at this point just for the robots to run around for continuous testing. So uh, then we get to the, the sort of the myth is that I asked how many people know about Ross and uh, Ross has got some great branding going on, right? People, they hear about Ross and they're like, oh, Ross solves robotics, right? It's got navigation. It's got arm planning through MoveIt. Uh, but it actually, Ross is, is really great for sort of your academic work, right? You've got navigation that works eh, some of the time. Uh, you've got arm planning that will plan you a nice path, you know, sometime, somewhere in the 30 second range maybe. Uh, it'll take about 30 seconds plan and come up with something and then you move and people look at it and go, why the heck did it move like that? Um, but it works out of the box. You didn't have to actually write any code on those sort of things. Uh, but we're not building uh, middleware, right? We're, we're building products, okay? So Ross is our, our middleware. Uh, in a lot of ways, I like to uh, make the analogy that 
if you're building you know, a big website online, right? you're building some sort of web services, you're not going to build the web server most of the time. Right? The, the internet really runs on you know, Apache or sort of the Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP, LAMP uh, setup. Right? Uh, in a lot of ways, ROS is like that. So it's a toolkit, and, and we do still, to this day, use ROS but only as a toolkit, right? We connect things up, uh, we use RViz, the visualization tools, um, and we've gone and then built our own navigation systems and our own motion planning systems. Uh, but we get a great head start with ROS. Um, one of the other aspects with ROS is that uh, while it is mostly nice open source, like BSD licensed, um, there are some licensing quagmires here and there throughout it. Um, and, and one of the first ones I'm going to hit on is uh, sort of the navigation or the mapping aspect. Um, so we look at these robots, we look at this $400,000 PR2, right? And uh, you say, but I've seen this, you know, $2,000 turtle bot has a prime sense sensor in it and it, it builds a map. Like, that's great. Um, you know, that's good. Let's, let's go sell that, right? Um, why do you need to build another robot? Um, unfortunately, the, uh, the map that comes out of your, your prime sense sensor uh, looks somewhat ridiculous. Uh, it only works in small areas, uh, things along those lines. And so one of the big things with taking robots out of the lab, in, in addition to that robustness aspect, uh, is the scalability, right? Um, if you look at most research robots are operating in relatively small labs, a couple hundred, couple thousand square feet, uh, something along those lines. Um, and the standard libraries, they'll work great there. They get you going along. Um, but replacing those standard libraries is one of those big jumps from academia into an actual product, an actual commercial solution. Um, and so uh, we've built a fairly impressive mapping system at this point uh, in that this is a 500,000 square foot map. Um, and so that's orders of magnitude larger uh, than anything you can build with sort of out of the box ROS at this point. Um, and this, this is one of those things where you can make this great demo with, uh, with the open source ROS, uh, you can get your funding and then you can actually go implement the real thing, um, which I think is one of the real powers of ROS. Uh, and at the same time as I think one of our biggest challenges is hiring because so many people can create this compelling demo and then go raise money to create their own startup. And so uh, all of the, the best roboticists want to go create their own startups because naturally you, know, you want to do your own thing. Um, so, so uh, yeah, so big, big maps. Um, in addition, if you're going to operate in this big map, right, you're going to operate in this large space, you're going to run around for a very long time, uh, you need a lot of reliability. Um, and so I think one of the, the interesting points is uh, how many people are familiar with Manuela Velosa's uh, Cobots? Anybody at CMU? A few? Okay. So the Cobots uh, run around and, and uh, you know, I, I end up crossing with Manuela at a lot of different uh, conferences and whatnot. She's always touting how, and they've got a press release and everything, how those robots, there's three cobots. Uh, they're basically telepresence robots that drive around their building all the time, right? So it's, it's like free range robots, right? They leave them out, they let them go around, people dial into them and whatnot, but they're autonomous when they're going from place to place, uh, and they ask for help from people when they need it. Um, they have three robots, uh, and over the span of three years, they actually went 1,000 kilometers, which sounds kind of impressive. Um, and, and certainly, like, that was totally state-of-the-art uh, in the research community, and, and even still is in many ways. Um, our robots, uh, we have a test facility. I don't actually have any nice images in here. I should have added that. Um, we have a test facility where it's a mocked-up warehouse. We go in and we change things on the robots, but there's a fleet running around all the time. Uh, of about a dozen robots, and each one of those goes about 35 kilometers a day across multiple char shifts and multiple charges, uh, which means they go 1,000 kilometers each month. So you very quickly have a very different aspect of scale compared to what is being done in academia. Uh, okay, so I'm going to go back to the, uh, the, the very, actually, if we, if we sort of go back here, uh, we can kind of look at... Um, the picture that I just put up, and I'm going to go back to in a moment, uh, freight looks a little bit different. Um, and so this is one of those lessons learned is that freight here, uh, you see it's sort of, eh, it's got the Fetch Robotics logo right there, right above the charge connector. Uh, nice straight line. Uh, there's only a laser on this robot. Uh, one of the things we've actually done uh, more recently, uh, this was sort of tail end of last year, beginning of this year, is that 
uh, you know, we went in with this idea that fetch and freight, they're going to work together, right? And so we're going to cost reduce things. We're not going to put 3D sensing on freight um, because there's always going to be a fetch there that can kind of look around and say, hey, look out for that. Uh, except you end up with a lot of applica you know, you end up with a lot of applications where uh, you want to deploy just freight, right? Uh, and so as we started to roll those out, we said, okay, so there's no fetches there to give us 3D. Um, we really do need 3D for a number of reasons, which I'm going to walk through here in a moment. Um, you know, we built in, we had the 25 meter laser, right? So that sees really far. It's actually a new unit uh, that uh, SIC built. Uh, we were one of the first to install that in a robot. Uh, we went back to them and said, hey, you know, we really need this longer range. We need this more accurate laser. So we've got this more accurate laser um, and we still run into issues. Okay, um, so one of the issues that you run into is that uh, there's a lot of dynamic stuff in the world. Uh, unlike your research lab, there's going to be a lot of things moving around on you. Um, so what we've got here is uh, on this side, you're actually seeing someone pushing a pallet jack by. Um, I didn't have a forklift when we were recording this, but uh, obviously our motivation is that there's lots of forklifts out there and we're dodging forklifts on, on a daily basis. Uh, here you can actually see what the robot sees initially and we're missing all of those tines, right? If we go around this obstacle, right, using just the laser, uh, we're going to hit something most likely, okay? Um, and so the 2D, adding in this 3D camera uh, into even your low-cost robot, now suddenly you can actually see the things that you need to avoid. Uh, one of the things we found we were running into is that people were leaving pallets in aisles that they weren't supposed to, right? They could mark out and say, hey, you know, this area is going to be kept clean. Don't leave anything here. And our robots would be able to navigate through it. But they wouldn't see the pallets because they were below the laser, right? Uh, or somebody leaves, uh, you, know, and, and, you know, they leave a tool on the ground that, that we're missing, right? Now we can actually pick those up. Um, and I think that's you know, go, there's, there's this trade-off uh, from a couple of standpoints is that, you know, now we need to use a lot more processing power, we're getting less battery life, there's a number of trade-offs there, um, and until you actually get in the field, you don't know that that's actually the thing you have to do. Uh, slightly different video, but kind of similar idea is that uh, people are, are obstacles too, and this is actually, I think, still an area that we're heavily working on, um, is that People have expectations, a lot of building a robotic product is managing the expectation of the people who are interacting with that robot, right? Um, they've seen too many movies, right? They expect that, uh, you know, robots are going to walk up and talk with them. Uh, you know, maybe they won't understand it like R2-D2, but there'll be another robot that we put there to help you decode what R2 is saying. Um, and so they have these expectations that robots are going to recognize that you're a person and they're going to respect, you know, social laws like, you know, uh, sort of the, the boundary between you and the robot, your personal space, right? Um, unfor uh, unfortunately, unless you add a lot of algorithms, right, uh, the thing you run into is that you're just another point, right? You're going to be avoided the same way as it avoids a shelf. Um, we have actually spent a lot of time working on uh, person recognition. Of course, if you look at where freight is, all you can actually see is their legs. Um, and then, uh, you know, that, that limits sort of how much, how much you actually can tell about that person. Um, and then, of course, you do get things like uh, the posts in a warehouse that sort of blockade, make sure that a forklift doesn't hit a big important shelf. Um, they look a lot like legs, too, and if you put two of them close to each other, and so now the robot's like swinging wide and, and you know, interacting with things that aren't people. Uh, so I think this is, this is still actually a big challenge for robotics in general is that uh, either managing the expectation of people of, of how the system's going to interact with them better uh, or actually improving the algorithm such that those robots do know that they're a person and they do you know, deal appropriately with them. Um, one of the other areas uh, that we've, we've actually put a lot of work into, uh, and this, this is another comparing sort of uh, the open source ROS navigation against what we run today. Uh, and, and in both of these, you're seeing sort of the cost map. So this is the robot's view of the world. And so this robot right here has a variety of sensors that are telling it what's out there in the world. Uh, it's marking the cost map and saying, hey, I can't drive into these areas that have stuff in them. Uh, one of the challenges you run into is that, say, the open source navigation stack or most 
navigation systems out there today for robots, uh, they basically only look at what's there right at that instant, and they plan around it, right? Planning algorithms are generally, you know, you need to give some representation of the environment, uh, and then you're going to plan around that. Um, but if your representation of the environment is exactly what you see right now, that doesn't work too well, uh, because we as humans, we make a lot of predictions, right? You're, when you're driving down the highway, you're predicting, oh, they've got a turn signal on, they're going to move into this lane, or, oh, they don't have a turn signal on, but I think they're still going to move into my lane. Uh, for robots, you, they need to actually do these same sort of things, right? Because if you plan to avoid an obstacle, and so what you're actually seeing here is another robot driving by, right? Um, and so here we have, and this is going to loop back around, um, this is with some estimate where it's saying, hey, I'm tracking this obstacle. I'm tracking it as it's moving along, and I'm saying that it's, uh, you know, and so when it's not being tracked, all you get is where that robot is. Uh, this became very important for us uh, when dodging forklifts, uh, because forklifts move a lot faster than our robot. So if we aren't predicting where it's about to be, uh, by the time we get in its way, uh, the robot's kind of dead. Uh, so uh, th these kind of challenges as you get out of the world, uh, and, and I think actually the bigger challenge for us in some of these is that when you go into a warehouse and they're like, oh, no, 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 the forklifts, they don't go in this section. We're going we're, we're to have your robots over here in this section where we're handpicking. There's no forklifts allowed. About 10 minutes later, you're going to see a forklift go through there um, e every time. Uh, so uh, people don't, you know, they, they're like, oh, no, we've got rules. But even the people don't follow the rules in, in many of these facilities. And so, uh, you know, sort of being on the lookout for those sort of things is a very important part of, uh, you know, developing these kind of robotic products and getting them out in there. Because if you, if you just ask people how their environment works, they're going to tell you what they think. But until you go there and sort of observe it yourself, knowing what the limitations of your platform are, you're not actually going to get the answers that you want. OK. Uh, so that's kind of my, my coverage of a couple of things of, of sort of the, the challenges that we've gone through. I'm going to kind of finish up with uh, you know, sort of what these uh, robots actually do, right? So uh, you know, we started out initially, of course, of, yeah, we're going to put fetch and freight out there. We still intend to do that. Like that, that is our grand vision. Um, uh, Fetch obviously has a number of challenges in, in addition to what is a challenge for freight. Uh, it, you know, if once you've solved all of your navigation and getting information into the system, uh, then adding on the picking module is not all that. Uh, you know, well, it is a lot, but uh, it's you know, if you're trying to do them both in parallel, it's it's certainly a challenge. Um, so we have a number of robot uh, applications out right now out in the world. Um, that are based primarily on freight. Uh, Fetch is still selling great in research. Uh, we're doing a lot of R&D with that. Um, but, but the thing we're deploying right now, because we want to get into the market, and we want to set those expectations, right? Uh, once you've had freights in your facility, you're like, oh, yeah, this is exactly how robots work for me. This is the great stuff that they do. I understand this, right? You're, you're like, OK, let's, let's bring some more in, have them do more and more tasks, right? Um, and so we have a system that we call the, the virtual conveyor, and I've got a video right after this, uh, which is basically a, a freight uh, that uh, has sort of a touch screen on it uh, and, and runs through their facility, and you can move things around. So this solves just the one piece of the puzzle. It solves, hey, we've got, we're spending 50% of our time moving things around, right? Um, we don't, it doesn't solve getting the stuff onto the robot. It doesn't solve getting the stuff off of it. Um, but it tackles sort of the very first task that you need to do in the warehouse. Uh, the other part is that it doesn't uh, actually require integration. Uh, because as it turns out, as hard as the robot problems are, uh, it's all the other things that actually consume uh, a ton of time. Uh, let me actually kick over to this one, because uh, these are out of order. Uh, so. It's actually the other things that really take up a lot of your time, right? Things like integration, right? Every warehouse has their own uh, software system, and they're all very hesitant to change anything about that. Uh, you know, it takes six months a year to sort of go through and review this integration that you're going to do. Uh, wireless connectivity. Uh, all of this assumes that, you know, the robots can actually talk to the system and get tasks and whatnot because don't really want to be yelling at a robot and trying to do speech recognition on a warehouse floor when you've got forklifts zipping around. Uh, and safety is, is another big area here is that uh, traditional robot safety, uh, things like ISO 10218, 
uh, parts one and two basically say, oh, it's a robot, it's dangerous, put it in a cage. Uh, and so the safety standards in many ways are still evolving and in many ways are evolving a lot slower than especially Silicon Valley uh, and the startup, the even just worldwide robotics startup community is moving much faster than the safety standards are able to keep up, right? And so you have to go and, you know, piece pieces together and use aspects that came out of committee and whatnot. Um, but even big players in this area, uh, you know, the big incumbents and whatnot, they're trying to be more adaptive in order to meet the needs of warehouses. And they're finding that the, the safety is a challenge as well. Um, and so I did have, uh, so the, I did have one more slide in here, which was that uh, from that virtual conveyor, uh, you know, just give you an, uh, another aspect of where we spend a lot of time. Uh, this is our uh, web-based UIs, right? And so we have, you know, we have a team that's, you know, maybe a dozen people working on the robot side. We have an equal or probably in the future larger team that's actually working on all of the enterprise side of connecting things up, uh, right? So you've got web UIs that are allowing you to go in and build a map with a robot because you don't want to try and teach someone who's, you know, used to just an RFID gun how to use ROS and RVIS. That's doomed from the get-go. Um, so easy to use web interfaces that connect all of these things together, uh, allow you to go in and create tasks, monitor the robots, see what's going on. Uh, you're trying to actually make the robot part disappear in their mind, right? Uh, if, if they don't have to think about it as a robot, it's just another piece of IT equipment, right? There's something out there. It's, uh, it's a smart conveyor. It's moving stuff around. Uh, that is sort of success in those, those facilities, right? You want to actually take and hide all of the robotics behind things they're more used to, web interfaces, for instance. Um, and then also, I, I, the one other thing I've got a note on here is that uh, uh, we're also doing some other things where uh, the business model actually comes into play, right? Of we're doing robotics as a service, right? So. Uh, you don't actually buy our robots, uh, so I'll, I'll be able to handle that one of the question of like, how much does the robot cost? Well, you can't actually buy freight. Um, uh, we don't sell our commercial robots. You actually get them on a lease program, and so then you pay a monthly fee, uh, and, and so it's very easy to come up with your ROI on that, and you don't have these barriers to entry of, hey, I've got this huge capital expense on, at the get-go to get these robots in. Um, because you've got sort of the same server, they're all sharing the maps and the tasks, you can actually scale your fleet pretty quickly as well, uh, add additional robots or remove them from time to time. Uh, and that is actually what I've got uh, for a set of slides. Um, uh, yeah, so questions. No, we're, we're definitely still doing it. It's just not the product today, right? Um, so we're still, uh, Fetch is still being sold as a research platform with the open source move it and, and navigation, which we've contributed quite a bit to as well. Uh, on the commercial side, I, I don't talk about it as much because the stuff we're doing in R&D, I don't want to talk about yet. Um, but uh, we are looking to be sort of piloting that aspect in certain cases, you know, next year. Uh, and so, uh, you know, it does take a little bit longer to get there, um, you know, that you do need, I think one of the biggest challenges with it is, is maybe not even the grasping, it's, it's the perception, right? So the combination of the perception uh, and then the integration, uh, because now if you want to tell this robot what to do, it's not as easy as saying, oh, hey, I've got this map, go to this location in your map, right? That's completely free of their integration. Uh, if we want to do that dynamically, then you need an integration with a warehouse management system, a WMS. Uh, but for the picking, you really need the WMS on day one. There is no, uh, you know, I, I think of the, the virtual conveyor, it's sort of like a gateway drug to robots in that, hey, you can get it in there, you've set it up, and you're like, oh, this is great. Now let's add a WMS. Okay, now let's add fetch, right? And so uh, you can sort of build out from there, um, but you really do need the WMS aspect before uh, you can really get interesting. I, there, there are some applications, but they don't really have the volume for the amount of time you would spend on them. Uh, 
yeah. Commercially or open? So w which side are you talking about? You, you're, you're coming from the research side, though. Of is that what you're asking, or okay? Yeah, so I, I think there's there are things out there. Uh, they're not they, they tend to be very specific, right? I think one of the things when you look at uh, robot perception today, um, it tends to be very very application specific, uh, and is is rarely generic. Uh, and and also a number of those kind of companies, uh, Industrial Perception was another spin out of Willow Garage, right? Um, and their whole thing was we're going to do 3D perception for industrial robots, uh, and they started with a very broad, like all, all perception, um, and they focus down on, on sort of pat loading and unloading tractor trailers uh, with a robot arm, right? And so now they're just doing boxes in a somewhat uh, constrained environment, right? Because perception is actually, we're, we're, we're probably a couple conceptual leaps away from generic perception even, right? Uh, you know, motion planning, there's, there's sort of you know, a, a fairly good understanding of how to do motion planning. It's, it's a matter of speeding it up and, and maybe changing some of the product problem representation in order to get those speed ups that you need. I think from the perception side, it's, it's potentially a couple of conceptual leaps away from how to even approach the problem. Potentially, uh, if it's a, if it, if it fits within sort of a method and whatnot, uh, maybe I, I am not a patent attorney on that one, so yeah, um, I, you know that would be. I, I, there's limits on what you can patent, right? Uh, and so that that is one of the aspects uh, to certainly be aware of. I don't know that there's a, a central group thinking about that. Um, I think one of the things you'll see is that, uh, you know, even, even with what we're doing, right, um, we're not, you're making the people more efficient, right? You may, you may see some, you know, hey, we don't need to add headcount to keep up, right? Uh, right, in many of the locations we're going into, nobody's letting people go, right? It's that they've got so many open positions to fill, and I think, you know, computers, uh, you know, I mean, if, if we look at robots as, hey, there are computers on wheels, right? Uh, computers have already changed the way we do work drastically. I think we were talking right before this was that, uh, you know, we have two mechanical engineers uh, in, in, our, in our company, right? Uh, if you tried to do this 40 years ago, you would have probably needed 100 mechanical engineers because, you know, the CAD analysis that we were able to do in a matter of hours, right, uh, would have taken weeks with a person basically writing it all out on paper. Um, and, you know, there's all types of new jobs in that. Now there's people building those CAD tools, right? Uh, yeah, I think it, it, it changes. So ROS2 is uh, not quite ready for prime time yet. Uh, in a lot of ways, uh, ROS2 is probably a year or two away from where you want end users to be working with it, right? Um, and so uh, the way I look at it is uh, it doesn't have the key tools yet of, a, you know, it doesn't have RViz 
ported over, right? Uh, I think once you, we see that, hey, the build system is stable, uh, there's tools like Arvis, uh, you know, all the command line tools of the I interacting with the topics have been replicated, uh, then it would probably be time to start looking at that. Um, certainly, ROS2 is very appealing to industry um, because it is based on industry standard systems like DDS. Uh, you can buy security rated or safety rated versions of, the, of DDS. Uh, and so it, it definitely has, has appeal, uh, it's just not there yet. Uh, so our, when we sell fetch into research, um, there are some things that are closed. Uh, the drivers are closed primarily because it's our only way to maintain certain, certain safety limits, right? The firmware and the drivers you can't get into. Um, but everything above that basically is, is open source. So we've done uh, configurations for the ROS navigation stack, the open source version uh, that run out of the box. Uh, we've done uh, configurations for MoveIt, uh, so that's ready to go. We've released and, and fixed some things in MoveIt to make it work better with our robot. Uh, we've also got a gazebo simulation of it. Uh, one of the things I think is really cool uh, is if you are a researcher and you're looking at robots, you can download our simulation right now. It's totally free, it's, it's totally open source. Uh, and you can actually run a demo in that where the robot drives across a simulated room, goes over, picks up a block uh, off a table, tucks its arm, goes back down, drives over and puts it down on another table. So you actually have a mobile manipulation demo right out of the box in Gazebo that's entirely open to go in and look at. Uh, it's actually, uh, I'm pretty sure, BSD from top to bottom. Uh, and so uh, that same code then also runs on the robot. You gotta build your own map and sort of set up where your tables are and whatnot, but you could run that same demo out of the box, which is actually really powerful because like the PR2 went a long ways, but on the, day, on the first day the PR2 shipped, it didn't have, there was no move it, arm nav was still uh, under development, and so there really wasn't the equivalent for, hey, out of the box, let's do some mobile manipulation. I think there's one in the back if we want. Yeah, so I think there's a couple of trends going on is that uh, sort of the build a giant warehouse out in the middle of nowhere to be close to trucking lanes but on cheap land, that's changing uh, certainly, right? Uh, and, and I think that's actually, you know, we're able to adapt to that. Uh, you know, one of the things you're seeing is uh, big box stores trying to co-locate warehouses inside the back of their stores. Um, that's challenging because they're not gonna build conveyor in the back of your local Walmart. Um, they need something else that's gonna get them the throughput that they need and be more dynamic and be able to adjust faster. Um, so I, I think there are some trends like that where you're seeing we need to move it closer to the city centers if you're gonna get this two hour delivery or you know, even next day delivery. Uh, you know, it changes some of the, where you're placing warehouses and how they're built. Uh, I think it actually though says, hey, we should automate them more you know, with more agile automation than traditional conveyor and whatnot. Uh, so the robot's located on your location, but everything's running in the cloud, is what you're yeah, saying? Or? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, 
I think it's the sensor part in between that's a challenge, right? Um, you know, if you have, I, I think you can work around some of the latency. Um, you still need a certain amount. I, I think the thing that you won't be able to get away from is you still need a certain amount of ROS on the robot um, because you need to get, you know, if you have a local robot, uh, you need to have the high, higher speed control loops for the individual robot. You're going to have to interact with the hardware for the sensors and whatnot. Um, we do, uh, I didn't really talk about it, but, uh, and it's, it's not in the cloud at this time, but um, the robots, right, when you have a set of robots in a facility, they're communicating with that server that's serving up all of those UIs. Uh, it's also doing global path planning for multiple robots, right? And so it's telling these robots how to roughly, at a, at a much higher level plan, how to avoid each other, right? Um, because the easiest way to get the fastest movement is to keep the robots apart and then they don't interact because if you have two things running the same algorithm, they usually don't cooperate nicely. Um, yeah, so I think, I, I think you still need something local. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think there's the tolerance for doing that has moved a lot. I, I think one of our biggest concerns with cloud aspects is just will uh, how, how does the customer, uh, you know, does that, how, how does that limit the choice of customers, right? Is, are too many of your customers who have these sort of out in the middle of nowhere warehouses problematic? I think in other markets where you know you're, you have better connectivity, it's a little bit of an easier jump. Um, I was actually at a, a workshop uh, at Case uh, two weeks, three weeks ago, uh, and there was a talk from the, the head of Amazon, Amazon Robotics R&D Group. Uh, where he was saying that they have actually moved their systems what, that used to be on site and they were adamant, no, we'll never go to the cloud, I, I was, was sort of their take. They're in the cloud, right? Uh, and so I think the, the tolerance for that is changing. Um, they have the advantage that they've got a single source customer and you know, they, they have a little bit more control, uh, but it's certainly something we're investigating as well.